Hi, this is Rob, and I want to show you my city, Melbourne. Behind me, you can see the Yarra River and the skyline of the city. In this video, I wanted to show you the top 20 tourist attractions in Melbourne. List like this, as always, they're very subjective, and it's all down to personal opinion. This video complements my previous video on the top 10 free things to do in Melbourne. So please have a look at that video as well. This list is in no particular order. So I've got a lot to cover here, so here we go. For those unfamiliar with Melbourne, it's located here in the southern part of Australia. With this list, I'm going to stick with the Melbourne CBD area, or just on the edge of the city, with the exception of the zoo. On my previous video, I showed the, the Shrine of Remembrance and the Botanic Gardens, so you can get an idea of where they're located in relation to the city. As you can see, the zoo is a bit further out, but I'll go into that later. So let's start with the Eureka Sky Deck Tower. The viewing deck is actually on the 88th floor, which is the highest viewing platform in the Southern Hemisphere. It offers some of the most spectacular views of Melbourne. You can see the tower from most parts of the city in Melbourne, as it's nearly 300 metres in height. The terrace area, it gets you outside with the elements. If there is strong winds, this area is actually closed. From the viewing deck, you do get a 360 degrees view of Melbourne and its surrounding areas. The sky deck also has some pinpointed key landmarks with some viewfinders. If you don't have vertigo, try the glass cube experience that extends out three meters from the building. Or you can fake it at the green screen with some pretty cool photos to impress your family or friends. For me, I think the best time to come is just before sunset so you can get to see Melbourne in daylight hours, as well as watching the city lights come alive. It just looks magnificent. On the 89th level, there is a restaurant. Check out their website for more details. The Sky Deck is highly recommended. Another popular attraction in Melbourne is the Melbourne Star. Pose for a photo before you enter the ride. First time in the Melbourne Star? Yes. Fantastic, mate. No worries, it's a good morning to come and do it. The sun following the side of yeah. itself. So we're going to get you in cabin number eight today. We'll okay. come a little bit close up before I let you on through. Okay. Uh, there's a few things I'd like to point out first though. The cabin is going to keep moving as you board, so yep. please be careful of that. Yes. There's also going to be a little gap that you'll see between the red platform. The ride moves quite slowly and is quite a smooth I'm ride. I'm Melbourne Star here. This is the beginning of the trip. Welcome to the Melbourne Star. Cabins are air conditioned and have a running commentary to point out the landmarks and features around Melbourne. Some of the commentary is really informative and it's well worth listening to. Between 1851 and 1868, a total of around 150,000 people came to Victoria seeking their fortune. Back then, immigrants came from all over the world, and many of these were Chinese. So it's no wonder that Melbourne today boasts one of the oldest Chinatowns outside mainland China. The Queen Victoria Market, a little to the left of the CBD. It's the largest open air market in the Southern Hemisphere and the views are just fantastic. They do offer night rides, which I think would even look better with the lights on of the city. When you exit, it takes you through the mandatory gift shop, and if you want to buy the photos you took at the beginning of the ride, you can also purchase them here. It's a bit pricey though. Sea Life Melbourne Aquarium is a great family-friendly tourist attraction in Melbourne, particularly if you're into the sea life. There's plenty of exhibits here, Some of them allowing you to get up and close with the sea animals, such as at the rock pools display. It's great for kids. You can interact with things or just learn about the marine life. Some of the displays are set up with lots of color and it really looks spectacular. It's pretty cool walking through the main aquarium as the tunnel takes you through the tank. The fish here swim around you and over the tunnel. It's great for taking photos here. There's plenty of fish here, including rays and sharks. If you get hungry, there's a cafe, and surprisingly enough, they have fish and chips on the menu. The penguin exhibit is really worth checking out. It's set up complete with snow to make the penguins feel more at home. 
Some come right up to the window. Penguins are always fun to watch. They also have an area where the penguins can swim in front of a huge window. I really like this exhibit. Overall, the aquarium is a great place to spend a few hours at. Sticking to the animal theme is the Melbourne Zoo. As I mentioned before, the zoo is outside the CBD area, and this means it's outside the free tram zone as well. So if you want to catch public transport, you're going to have to buy a Mikey card. You will need to get one of these cards. You can purchase them from 7-Eleven. Check out the website for more details. You can catch number 58 tram from William Street in the city, or a train from Flinders Street. Catch the upfield line and get off at the Royal Park Zoo stop. For more details on the transport, you can check out the zoo's website. When you do enter the zoo, they provide you with a map so you can plan your trip around the zoo. There's also maps dotted around the zoo as well. There's plenty of animals to see here, such as the popular lion enclosure. Although the day I went, they were pretty much hidden. There's all types of monkeys. African wildlife. Sea life. And birds. There are some enclosures that allow you to get up close with some of the animals which is a real treat. And you can see some of these animals exhibit almost human-like traits. Just like us, they like to get a bit of sunshine. Another must-see is the butterfly enclosure. Lots of different types of butterflies. Some of them even land on you. There's also a number of endangered species here, including the tiger and the orangutan. So check those out. The orangutans actually seem like they're just as interested as we are as with them. Of course, there's also the Australian bush enclosure, where you can get to see some natural Australian animals. For food, there's plenty of cafes dotted around the zoo, each with their own animal-themed stores. The zoo is definitely worth checking out, especially if you have a family. The Shrine of Remembrance. I did talk about this place on my previous video where I showed the free things to do here. In this video, I wanted to show you the paid tour that you can do. I highly recommend doing this as it gives you a real insight into the shrine itself. The tour takes you all over the shrine and down into the War Museum. Major ones, it's like the shape of our courtyard walls to resemble the zigzag pattern of the trenches of the First World War. Finished in 1934. The elements are very typical of Greek and Roman influence, as you can see with those columns and the pyramid-shaped roof. Now, the triangular piece above the door is the call to arms, or calling them to arms, come and support us. When you get closer, you can see images there of women weeping. It's symbolism that the boats would have come in and the first thing they would have seen the shrine. It's that, that sort of welcoming feel. Now on Remembrance Day, the 11th of November, a natural ray of light So when war broke out in 1914, Australians all volunteered to go. They were keen to get there. Originally it was supposed to be sent to the UK to, to train, but they were diverted to Egypt. And you'll get a real appreciation of what the shrine is all about. If you're into history or, or Australian involvement in wars, then this is a must do. I really enjoyed this tour and I highly recommend it. The Old Melbourne Jail, one of the most famous tourist attractions in Melbourne. 
and it's had 133 hangings of criminals here, including the most iconic bush ranger in Australia's history, Ned Kelly. Inside the jail, you'll find lots of informative information on the way of life in the jail. You can take a self-guided tour, or you can pay an extra $5 to get a guided tour, which I would recommend. You'll learn a lot about Where the place. Is what remains of Melbourne's very first permanent purpose-built prison, opened in 1845. Okay. Um, it was the first permanent prison, so originally it held anybody on a long-term, uh, well, long-ish term, prison sentence here in Victoria. But up to then, most of the cells wouldn't have had any artificial lighting, because all of the artificial lighting up to electricity involved a flame. Now, what's the first thing that happens in a prison riot? Oh. Um, and if you're into uh, the supernatural, most of this they even do ghost tours of the, the jail years. at night. Check out their website for more details. Stop working. <laughs> 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 no problem there. Uh, <laughs> they've reported, uh, men particularly have reported, as they enter the cell feeling a pressure on their chest as though it's um, pushing it back. But there had been two previous places where they did the hangings in the 1840s, they were done in public public event and almost the entire citizenry of the small settlement of Melbourne turned out, which is gruesome. And then they moved it inside the walls of the jail and it was in the location out in the yards out here. And then in 1865 they put it right here inside the cell block. And it was relatively a private execution from then on and was only the official thing. After the jail they offer a watch house experience which you get to see the lock-up area. I found this part a bit weak, although the exhibit on the Hoddle Street bombing was quite interesting. In the lovely Fitzroy Gardens is Cook's Cottage. You can buy tickets at the Information Centre, which is just across from the cottage. It was originally constructed in 1755 in England and brought to Melbourne in 1934. The interior furnishing is set out as it would be in the 1700s. There's usually a couple of volunteers dressed up in 18th century costume to provide some information. At the back of the cottage, there's a history on Captain Cook and his voyages. The place is well worth a visit. The Polly Woods side is a three-mast cargo vessel built in 1885 that was used to carry coal and wheat. If you're a person with any interest in ships or marine history, the Polly Woods side's worth checking out. There's a theatre, you can watch a short video on one of the voyages of the Polly Woodside. There's an exhibit on objects from the ship's past. Or just go on board the boat to see how life was like. You can also take a guided tour of the boat. The Melbourne Museum is one of the best museums in Melbourne with some excellent exhibits that will delight the whole family. The IMAX City is also part of this complex and you can buy tickets to see movies here too. If you want, there's some guided tours of the museum. There's plenty of exhibits here, from permanent to temporary ones. The Dinosaur Walk has 17 prehistoric animals on display. There's also an animated show on how these animals lived. There's creepy crawlies in the Bugs Live exhibit, from beautiful butterflies to all types of bugs and spiders. Wild features over 600 animals from birds, mammals and reptiles. The Mind takes you on a journey through experiences and artworks and it's very interesting. Learn about the history and culture of Victoria's Aboriginal people. The Melbourne Story gives you a great insight into the past and present of this wonderful city Melbourne. This museum is packed with stuff to see and it's highly recommended. The Immigration Museum lets you learn about immigrants to Australia which helped form our unique culture. The museum has a number of exhibits, some of them are permanent and some well, first are and temporary. show you this trail of migration. We work there with communities, today you're going to have a look at the Ithaca Islands, part of the Greek heritage. On the second level you start coming into identity, which is a permanent exhibition, more reflecting on uh, contemporary issues in our modern society today with multicultural diversity, and some challenges may refer to that. It's a fantastic museum to check out, lots of individual stories, some very sad, right from the pre-1830s up until today. 
You also get to see how immigrants travelled to Australia over the years and how it's changed. It's a museum well worth checking out. The Chinese Museum, another fantastic museum to visit in Melbourne, which is focused on the Chinese history in Australia. There are a number of levels with both permanent and temporary exhibits. The Han Dynasty exhibit has been extended until July 2018. It shares stories, ideas and innovations during this period. Some interesting temporary exhibits included the Chinese Anzac one. The Chinese played an important part in Australia's gold rush era and in this exhibit you'll find lots of interesting things about the gold rush era. There's a dragon gallery that shows dragons used in parades in Melbourne. It's a really interesting museum and it's well recommended. For sports lovers, check out the National Sports Museum at the MCG or Melbourne Cricket Ground. A must do if you're into Aussie rules or cricket in particular is the MCG Tour. The informative guys take you around the magnificent sporting the ground. Of the World Cricket Cup final, which was played here between Pakistan and England. You will get to see all the important areas of the ground. Here they use that bush ranger's room and the visiting team play a test match in Melbourne. This is the Australian room and they're just setting up the lockers around the uh, perimeter of the room. You also get a quick rundown of the other nearby sporting facilities. Since 1988, the main stadium where the crane is, that's the Rod Labor Arena. It's well worth doing this tour. The actual sports museum is an excellent place not only to see the major sports code, such as cricket, but there's also plenty of memorabilia on the Olympics and heaps of other sports. There's an interactive area where you can test out your own skills. It's a must do for anyone who has an interest in sport. One great way to see the city of Melbourne is to take a Yarra River cruise. Melbourne Cruises offers two sightseeing tours, Cruise A, which is the Melbourne Harbour Cruise, and Cruise B, the Parks the and Rivers Cruise. In 1946, the interesting thing about it is that it was built and finished in 1952 entirely by women of huh? Yarra, which is one of the most desirable servants to live in Melbourne, because it has old architecture, large home and structures, if you haven't been to Melbourne before, it's a great way to see Melbourne from another view. The cruises give you a running commentary of the landmarks around Melbourne. If I had a choice of doing only one of these tours, I would pick Cruise B, the Parks and Rivers one, as it gives much more nicer views. They do offer packages to do both, so check out their website for more details. The cruises are nice, but I wouldn't say it's a must do. If you want to see Melbourne in a different way, and you're a bit of an adrenaline junkie, why not take a helicopter sightseeing tour of the city? I've not tried it myself, but I'm sure it'll be someone's cup of tea. I've listed a couple of companies here I know, if you want more information. The Crown Casino is one of the most popular places in Melbourne, not only for gambling, but it's a whole complex of shops, restaurants, a movie theatre, and even hotel. It's a great place to spend some time at. Melbourne's famous laneways give the city a bit of a European feel. If it's for a coffee or for a bite to eat, there's plenty of restaurants and cafes to discover with some fantastic tasting food. It's what Melbourne's all about. For more info, check out the link shown. Melbourne's arcades, some go back to the marvellous Melbourne days back in the 1880s. Check out the ones such as the Block Arcade and the Royal Arcade. As mentioned in my previous videos, some of these are modelled off European arcades. Wonderful architecture, visit boutique shops or some of the cafes. A great place to explore Melbourne. Shopping. Melbourne's CBD area has plenty of shopping opportunities. Start with the Burke Street Mall where you'll find some of Australia's largest department stores such as Meyer and David Jones. This Melbourne Central with plenty of shops, QV 
and even DFO in South Wharf. Up the top of Collins Street, they have some more upmarket boutique shops you can look at. Street art. Well, I could have listed this under laneways. I wanted to show this separately. Melbourne has some amazing street art in a number of laneways around town and have become popular tourist attractions in their own right. You can actually take tours just to see them. I have shown that in my other video. One good thing, the art is regularly changing. So if you come back, you might see some new stuff. The National Gallery of Victoria. I did mention the free stuff you can do here on my previous video. I just wanted to show you they do have some excellent paid exhibits as well. Just recently, they had the Christian Dior exhibit, which had over 140 garments dating back to 1947. An excellent exhibit. Unfortunately, this was just finishing as I made this video. But if you check out their website, you can see what they're showing currently. Just as a matter of interest, if you are planning to see multiple attractions in Melbourne, you may want to have a look at iVenture. They offer discounted rates on certain tourist attractions and you can purchase one of their cards. Have a look at their website for more details. It may or may not work out for you. Just do your homework. Also, if you're a RACV member, sometimes they offer discounts to some attractions in Melbourne as well. So there you have it, my top 20 tourist attractions in Melbourne. Yes, I did cover some of these in my other video. So hopefully the information was a bit different from that one. I just wanted to keep it to an even 20 tourist attractions. There's plenty of other things to do in Melbourne, but this list will give you a great start. And most of all, I hope you found this helpful. For more travel videos and hotel reviews, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you next time. Cheers.